Good afternoon. Stop moving seats. I, I, some people are. Some people are staying where they are. That's good. Other people, hi, Isabel. Uh, other people moving. I don't know why everyone's over here this year. It's like, I, have to, I feel like I have to stand here because this is like two-thirds of the class. Anyways, all right, so chapter 13. Let's pick up um, and begin, shall we? So chapter 13 talks about the molecular, is, well, it's titled The Molecular Basis of Inheritance. What do we know about DNA? What do we know about inheritance in general? Nothing. Come on. What's in so from last semester, what did we talk about was inherited? Traits, right? Traits are inherited. Mendel said traits were inherited from parent to offspring, right? And he did all his peep pod experiments, etc. Then we figured out that genes are, are transferred from parent to offspring. Okay, we talked, then um, Morgan did his uh, experiments with the Drosophila, right, and figured out how, where genes are on, an, on a chromosome, and that chromosomes are, are, move, are actually transferred from one parent, one generation to the next. Okay? But up until then, we still didn't know what the genetic material was. Now, you all know, you've learned in like fifth grade that what's the genetic material in, in humans and eukaryotic cells? DNA. You all know that. But how did we get to that point? Okay? How did we get to a point where we understood that DNA is the genetic material? Because what are chromosomes made up? So... Let's, we go back thinking about 1800s. Uh, we have uh, Mendel. He's talking about traits. And Morgan now understands that chromosomes, that genes are on chromosomes. Up to this point, chromosomes are made up of what? Proteins and nucleic acids. So up to that point, the, the genetic material could be proteins. All right? It could be proteins. It could be DNA. It could be genetic material. It could be nucleic acid. We don't know yet. All right? We're going to figure that out. And then when, after we figure that out, we're also going to figure out that the structure of that genetic material. And we know who figured out the structure of DNA? Watson and Crick. With a little stealing of, from Rosalind Franklin. Okay? Little trivia about Watson there. He got a Nobel Prize in 1953 for the, his work, him and, him and Crick, right? That Nobel Prize was just put up for auction uh, probably less than a month ago because Watson is in debt. He sold his Nobel Prize for four and a half million dollars. The person who bought it then gave it back to him. Aww. The reason why he was in debt because he was actually blacklisted from the scientific community in general because he made uh, quite a few racist comments. So, you know, whatever. Just saying. So we know that DNA is a substance of inheritance. We know that that's the genetic material, right? And it's, they say it's the most celebrated molecule of our time, and it is. Everything goes back to the instructions that are found within the DNA. All right? Your, her your heritable information, your genes, are coded within the DNA itself. All right? And we're going to talk about DNA replication, how that is <coughs> produced, how is it trans or transferred from one cell to another so that each cell has its exact copy. Here's Watson and Crick doing their, um, doing their thing. You know, deciphering the structure, the double helical structure of DNA. Okay? Now, 
So let's go back to where the starting point we had, where we left off with Mendel, and he had Mendel and Morgan and, and chromosomes being transferred from one generation to the next or one cell to the next. All right? So at this point, the identification of those molecules was a big, a big technological obstacle. Right? What else is happening at this time? What else is being invented at this time or being um, advanced? at this time, early 20th century. Hmm? Stronger, microscopes. stronger microscopes. And as you have stronger microscopes, better technology, the better advancement in science that we could have. So, so Morgan's group showed that the genes are located on chromosomes. The two chromosomes are DNA and protein. So either DNA or protein, or DNA and protein together, is the genetic material. Okay? So they're the candidate. Now, how do we determine one versus the other, all right? The key factor for doing this was to look at well, how, what organisms are we going to use, what experiments are we going to use to determine which one's going to be the, the genetic material, all right? And this was first discovered by using bacteria. And bacteria, which you'll do in lab next week, have a unique ability to pick up pieces of DNA from their outside, pick up pieces of junk DNA from their, out, from the, from their environment, and then utilize them, all right, in a process called transformation, all right? So the role of DNA in heredity was first discovered by studying bacteria and the viruses that infect them. Those are called bacteria, okay? So this experiment by Griffith, all right, this is important. He worked with two strains of bacteria, okay? One strain was lethal, okay? The other strain was not, was harmless, okay? So what Griffith did was he had, here's strain of bacteria, okay, and I'm just going to lethal, okay? He's going to inject that into a little mouse, okay? Lo and behold, mouse dies. Okay? Lethal strain, mouse dies. Okay. Now, the next one, he has the non-lethal strain of bacteria, injects it into a mouse. What do you think happens? Mouse lives. Happy as can be. Okay? That shows you that there's a difference between the two strains of bacteria. They're the same bacteria family, just two strains. They behave a little differently. They have a couple different genes from them that are different. Okay? The next thing he does is, well, let's say he takes that lethal strain. Okay? So he has... the lethal strain, but instead he's heat killed them. Now what happens to bacteria when you heat them up and you, you break them down, you, feed, you boil them? What happens? They die. They're no longer going to work the right way, right? So we're going to call this one, put this one in uh, green, and we'll call this the heat kill, right, HK. What do you think is going to happen when he, when he injects the little mouse here? The mouse survives. Okay? The mouse survives. Okay? Now, what he does is, all right, well, if... Now, what if I mix the heat killed strain with the non heat killed harmless strain okay now the heat killed strain like the lethal strain that was heat killed didn't kill the mouse okay the harmless strain didn't kill the mouse right 
So now I'm gonna now he's gonna go. Let's take this big mammoth syringe, right? We're gonna have the heat killed plus the the non-lethal. Right? Injects it into the mouse. Right? Let's put a little ear on them. Okay? What happens to the mouse? Lo and behold, the mouse dies. And the reason for that was what? He, he, this was his observ observation, and his conclusion was that somehow the harmless bacteria picked up the trait of, or, or the gene that would be lethal to the, to the mouse. Somehow that harmless bacteria was transformed into a lethal strain. Okay? Now why does this experiment... Why is this experiment evidence that DNA is the genetic material and not proteins? Because proteins denature when they're heated, right? So if proteins break down and they're not in their right shape anymore, do they, ha do they, do they do their same function? No. What happens to DNA when it's heated? Does it change its shape? No, not really. It doesn't break up into its smaller parts, okay? The other thing unique about DNA and its structure is that although it's heated and it will separate into separate strands, what do we know about DNA that brings it back? <laughs> DNA likes to be double-stranded. And how will it, it will, will, will be called re-anneal. It will go back to its original shape when the, when the temperature goes down, okay? And therefore, this is evidence for DNA being the genetic material and not proteins. Okay? So he mixed the heat kill remains of the pathogenic strain with living cells, and therefore that's transfer from formation. Next week in lab, now we use this in the in the re, in the research field, we use this ability of bacteria to tra be transformed all the time. Okay? How many of you uh, know a diabetic who's insulin dependent? Where do they get that insulin from? from? Where, do, do they take it from humans? No. They grow it up in a lab. Okay? They grow it up in a lab, and what they've done is they've taken the human insulin gene and put it and transformed bacteria with that gene. They grow up this in this huge bioreactor, this huge thing you know, about the size of this room, bacteria swirling around, Right, that they're growing, and then they pellet it down and they extract all the insulin that's produced from the bacteria because they're producing insulin, the human gene, the human protein insulin. They, and they extract it down and they end up giving, you know, giving you the pill form or in injectable form. All right? That is, that's an example of transformation. We didn't have this process of bacteria, didn't have this process process of transformation, things like that aren't done, all right? Medical advances like that aren't produced, okay? And that goes right back to the foreign DNA that we can use, all right? So here's a better example, a better illustration of what happens to the, the mice and the mixtures, right? So you have your living non-pathogenic strain or the pathogenic strain, mouse dies. The living non-pathogenic strain, right, mouse is healthy. The heat killed ones, mouse is healthy. You mix them together, uh oh, that's not going to work. Mouse dies. Okay? And the reason why this is an evidence for, for DNA being the genetic material is because proteins denature when heated. Right? And they, they, they denature functionally. All right? Later work by Oswald Avery and others, and that's why I named my daughter Avery. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. Not that much of a science. Okay? Maybe a little. But um, he identified that the transforming substance was DNA. All right? 
However, one conclusion wasn't enough to convince everybody. Right? Scientists are naturally skeptical to a fault. Okay? And so little was known about DNA at this point. More is known about uh, proteins. People were stubborn about the fact that they wanted proteins to be the genetic material and not DNA. Okay, fine. So, you have to support it. Okay? More evidence for DNA as a genetic material right, came from studies from bacteriophages. Okay? Viruses, or these viruses infect bacteria and they're commonly used in molecular genetics, right, in how bacteria work. Okay? A virus by itself is basically a piece of genetic material, whether it be RNA or DNA, enclosed by a capsid, all right? And the way bacteriophages work is that you have a bacterial cell, okay, here's your virus, right? It has, I'll show it's a little capsid, right? This is what it looks like, kind of, and inside <coughs> of that it has its little DNA, all right? Bacteriophage attached to the surface of the bacterium. The DNA just gets injected into the bacterium. And then what occurs, that whatever genes are on, the on, the, on that viral DNA, basically the virus hijacks the cell, produces more viral particles, and then eventually the, you, get, you get all these viral particles in here. Eventually, all these viral particles cause bursting of the cell, and then you get virus that are released to infect more cells. That's the basic life cycle of a virus. There's some more um, intricacies in that, but we'll, get, we'll go over that when we get to it when we talk about viruses. Okay? Oh, I, I was going to leave it on there, but... All right, so there's your phage head, the tail sheath fiber, and then uh, you can actually see by electron microscopy here, DNA being inserted into the bacterial cell, okay? And that DNA will then be, this is a way of introducing DNA into a bacterial cell that's not just being picked up from the environment. So this is not a form of transformation. This is called transduction. Right, or this now bacterial cell is going to be transduced. Okay. So now, Hershey and Chase. This is an awesome experiment, and I wish I did it in 1952, and I would be really rich. No, I'm kidding. Um, showed that DNA is the genetic material. Okay by using the phage T2, all right? Determine this, they designed an experiment showing um, that only the DNA of T2 and not the protein enters E. coli, okay? So we know that the bacteriophage, the protein, which is, makes up the capsid and the whole sheath on the outside, does not enter the cell, right? You know that, only the DNA does. And they showed that by, um, by this experiment, all right? What they did was they labeled the protein of the bacteriophage, right, with a radioactive label, all right? And protein only has, which is, they used a radioactive label, which is unique to proteins, and then they also use another radioactive label that is unique to DNA, okay? And then they basically looked at whether or not a, a, an infected strain of bacteria had either of those radioactive labels, okay? That's the synopsis of this experiment. What does it look like? So here, first, they're going to grow. Uh, how, do they first, how do they label the bacteriophage with the, pro the radioactive protein label, all right? 
So here, they grow up. They infect a culture of bacteria with the bacteriophage in the presence of radioactive sulfur. Okay? Sulfur, which is important in, is a important molecule in um, disulfide bridges, is important for protein production. Right? It's, it's actually found in several amino acids. Is sulfur found in DNA? No. All right? So this will uniquely label proteins and not DNA, right? Okay. So they grow up this bacteria. The sulfur is going to be incorporated into this bacterial capsids. And then they're, gonna, they're going to then break down and look at the virus after they, they grow it up in the, in the sulfur. Okay? They centrifuge a pellet and they look whether or not the bacterium which now, this bacterial culture which has been infected with, the, with this protein outside has, well, with the bacterium, with the virus that has the radioactive protein. You follow me? I kind of confused myself there for a second. All right? What's going to happen? The radioactive, the radioactive protein is going to stay outside of the bacterium, Right? Right? It's not going to get in. So now when they look at this last part over here, right, they look at this last bacterium, this pellet bacterium, they can assay that for radioactive um, sulfur, and there's none there. Shows no sulfur is getting into the cells. Okay? So no protein is getting into the bacteria. DNA. Right? But in this, uh, instead of radioactive sulfur, they use radioactive phosphorus. Why do they use ra radioactive phosphorus? Because phosphorus is found in DNA and is not found in proteins. Okay? So now we're going to selectively label DNA and not proteins. Why didn't they use nitrogen? Because it's found in both proteins and DNA. Okay? We know that proteins have an amine group, amino acids have an amine group that has a radioactive nitrogen. So the perfect explanation, a perfect selection of differentiated labels. Right? We can label just protein and label just bacteria or just DNA. Okay? And then we do the same thing. I'm going to grow up the bacteria phase in the presence of the radioactive phosphorus. That's going to label all the DNA. We're going to infect the culture of bacteria with that, in that radioactive bacteria phase. And then we're going to assay to see if that bacteria, that bac the infected bacteria, end up with radioactive phosphorus. And lo and behold, what does it do? You have radioactive phosphorus. Okay? That shows that DNA or the genetic material from this bacteriophage is going to be transferred into. And this says it's not protein that is the genetic material. Right? This is showing that not protein, but DNA is the genetic material. So this conclusion combined with that of a previous experience by Griffith proves that DNA is the genetic material. Then from here, it's a race. Now that you, we know what the genetic material is, from chromosomes coming passed down, it could have been DNA or protein. We identify, they have identified it as DNA. Now it's a race to decide and find out more about what DNA is. All right? Now, from last semester, you know the structure, basic structure of DNA. What is DNA made up of? Made up of nucleotides. What is a nucleotide? Let's draw out a nucleotide. Give me the parts of a nucleotide. Amy Joe. A sugar. And DNA has which type of sugar? Deoxyribose. And how many carbons are on that sugar? Five. Okay. Five carbon sugar. This is an oxygen right there, right? So we have another carbon right here. What else? 
What else makes up a nucleotide? So we have a five carbon sugar. Sienna. Phosphate group. Where's the phosphate group found? Off of the five. Off the five carbon. All right, so we're going to, good. Here's a phosphate group. Okay. What else makes up a nucleotide? A nitrogenous base. All right, we'll just put this here. And what are the four part? What are those four bases called, or what are they? Four possible bases are. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Okay, so that is a nucleotide. I'll just put NT. Not NIT. That's something completely different. Nucleotide. Now, what's important for numbers? Now, Sienna said it's the phosphates off the fifth carbon. What's on the, where is the um, nitrogenous base located? On what number carbon? One. Now, you'll see, as you learn in, in organic chemistry, you'll take the longest chain of carbons and you'll, you'll, name, you'll number them. Accordingly. So here's your longest chain of carbons. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. Right? Five carbon sugar. Okay? And we instead of five, we're gonna call it five prime, one prime, three prime. Okay? Now in order to to build this, what else do we know about DNA? So this is a nucleotide. We have to link these nucleotides somehow. How? To form a chain of nucleotides, which is DNA. How are we going to link them? Through hydrogen bonds. I want to create a chain of nucleotides down this way. Right? That would be one strand of DNA, and then we have to draw another strand. Which way? Which way the arrow is going to go? I'm going to go up. Why are they going to go up? Because we're anti-parallel, right? All right. So, in this case, this one's going to start at 5 prime and go to 3 prime. What is this one going to start at up here? Up at the top. 3 prime to 5 prime. Okay. So now how am I going to build these, these nuclei? How am I going to link these nucleotides together? Hmm? Like the opposite, like A and B. Okay. They will be complementary. Um, that I'm, how am I going to link the nucleotides together to form a full strand? So here, how am I going to link another nucleotide to this to make this strand? And then we'll, we'll do the same on this side, and then we'll link them together that way. Okay? Jessica? Okay, it does not attach to one of the carbons, but it does attach to the, the phosphate group attaches to the part, what part of the other preceding nucleotide, I should say. So... So here, off this three prime is an OH group, right? Right? And in order to add nucleotides to a strand of DNA, this part right here is very important. Okay? That free three prime OH, I'm going to say that again, a free three prime OH is necessary to add a nucleotide to this strand. Okay? Remember that. Because when we talk about DNA replication, we're going to need to produce that 3' prime OH to add nucleotides. Okay? Without that, we can't add them. All right? Because that's where it goes. So now, this hydrogen is going to come off. All right? And it's going to form a bond. And I'm going to just 
draw it kind of crazy like. Um, but we're going to form a bond with the phosphate group of the next nucleotide. All right, so then that's going to go to the carbon and then into your five carbon sugar. Then what's free for the next added, for the next nucleotide to add? Another OH, right? That's going to be free. And so subsequently growing the strand, you can always, you always have add a nucleotide, you have another free three prime OH. Add another nucleotide, you have another free three prime OH. And that can continue as long as it's necessary. Okay? And the same thing happens on the other strand, but in the opposite direction. Okay? So you'll have them, and they'll be orientated a little, they'll be orientated like this. All right, kind of upside down. And your phosphates, and it'll go this way, because you're five prime to three prime in that direction. Eventually, you end up with what's the important part? The nitrogenous bases are orientated towards one another. They're facing each other. So that now, like was said, uh, complementary bases, A to T, C to G, can line up, form hydrogen bonds, and now you have a double-stranded molecule. All right? That's the basic, of basic structure of DNA. Okay? Yes? <coughs> No, it, that hydroxyl group is always part of the five carbon sugar. Okay. okay, that is that is part of the deoxy or the ribonucleic acid. The ribose or the deoxy ribose has that OH right there. All right, the deoxy ribose versus the ribose changes at the two prime OH. One has an OH group, one has a hydrogen group. Okay. okay? Questions on that? 